by this rainy afternoon. Um, we have the pleasure to have Paul Groff today, who's going to talk about data integration and transparency tackling the tension. Um, Paul is currently Disruptive Technology Director at Elsevier's Lab, which is a super cool title. Um, he holds a PhD from Southampton and he worked previously at the University of Southern California. He was an assistant professor at FU in Amsterdam a few months slash years ago before joining the dark side of Elsevier's Labs. Okay, so thanks again for accepting to come here. Uh, Paul will be around FYI for a couple of days until Wednesday, I yeah, guess, so if exactly. you want to talk to him. And Paul, the floor is yours. Yeah, thanks a lot. Thanks a lot for having me. Um, no, I've gotten to talk to most of you one-on-one. Uh, -on -one. And so this is a, this is a bit of a two-sided talk. Um, so what I wanted to talk about really is this kind of conflict we, we have between wanting data integration and then also a need for transparency. And um, before I kind of get, it, get started on that, so a lot of my work is based around this assumption that a lot of great stuff happens when you remix things, when you combine things together to um, uh, create new creative ideas. Uh, so if you ever read a book called Where Good Ideas Come From, fantastic book by a guy named Steven Johnson, it really talks about how new ideas are formed. And one of his theses is that, in fact, you see a lot of these co-inventions of things, like, for example, radio. And that's because a lot of these ideas, these new things, are formed by piecing together existing ideas. And so this is a lot of um, the background or my motivation for doing particular research. And I, in particular, think the web accelerates this process, accelerates the process of remixing because it makes more material available. And so that's kind of like the philosophical kind of area of my work and just to kind of give you where my head is at. Um, so what are we gonna talk about in this talk? So we're gonna talk about data integration for analysis. So you can think about data integration as just remixing data, right? We can remix music, but we can also remix data. The need for transparency. So why do we care about knowing where things come from? Um, data provenance is a solution, and the infamous or not so infamous downloads fl folder problem. And I'll tell you what that is a little bit later. So how many of you work with data? Yeah, I, you're a computer scientist, work with lots of data. So how many of you have this problem of data preparation? So like banging your data into the right format so you can shove it into your algorithms. Is that a common problem? Yeah, it's a common problem for a, a lot of people. So there's a lot of different studies. There's a really good machine learning study around the time spent on um, data preparation. This is uh, one from a NASA technical report. Uh, that says essentially 60% of the time of actually doing data analysis is just banging your data together to get it in the right format for your algorithms. And so that's why we develop data integration platforms, right? To get our data in nice formats that can be fit into our analysis algorithms. And so I want to describe two kinds of data integration um, uh, issues and why data integration is a good thing. So I'll start with uh, one uh, project that I worked on for about three years. This is a project called Open Facts. And this was one of these monumentally massive EU projects. How many people have, I don't know if Switzerland does EU projects anymore? A bit? A bit? Less and less. Less and less, <laughs> right? Uh, if you've been on EU projects, these things could be big. This one was huge. It was like 18 partners, $18 million, big thing. And the whole point was to do public domain data integration. So these guys had the same problem that you guys have. Namely, they have to bang data from different sources, get it all in a nice format so they can put it into their uh, target discovery algorithms. So here we had involved companies like GSK, Lilly, uh, Bayer, uh, Novartis from Switzerland. And what they were doing is going out to the, all the public domain databases downloading them, getting them inside their firewalls, 
performing a bunch of data integration, and then doing their data analysis. And they were like, why are we doing this? This is not our core competency. What we would rather have is a data integration platform for all of these companies, a pre-competitive data integration platform. Great, so let's try to build one of these with all the money that the EU gives us. So how did we do that? Well, we made a set of prioritized research questions. We asked the scientist involved in the project, hey, how do you, what's the really hard questions you need to answer? So they came up with this fi one, find all oxyreductase inhibitors active in human mice under 100 uh, uh, nanomolars. Now, I don't uh, need you to know what that means, uh, but we actually asked a bunch of scientists to go solve this problem. Go, go solve this problem. So they did. So the first thing they did was they went out, they went out to the literature, and then they started grabbing uh, data. So this is IC50 values. And then they went to another database, and they grabbed some more data. And then uh, they went to another database and grabbed some more data. And they went to another database and grabbed some more data. And then they put it in a spreadsheet. So my question to you is, uh, oh, and then they did some manually filtering on the spreadsheet, right? That's because that's how we prepare data, right? We dump it in a spreadsheet and we, how many, how long did this take to do this? You guys should know, you're all kind of data munging experts. No, the kind of going out, downloading it, getting all, answering this question. So what I showed you, we can go back through it, right? So going to a database, downloading stuff, downloading stuff from this database, downloading stuff from this database, getting all the data from some of the data from the literature, and then kind of blopping it together. What do you think that took? Well, it's a, it's a nice, okay, so we're going to say months, we've got a mid-range of weeks. What else? Uh, it's, it's pretty small, so uh, 11,000 rows? Yeah, so these are all experts, I'll put that. A couple hours, okay, so we got a lower bound of an, uh, a couple hours, an upper bound of a couple months. Well, it takes a long time, right? I can, you guys kind of guess that. It was five people, all of them PhD uh, biologists and a, one chemist working six hours, right? So this is how they answered this question. They got them all in the room. They said, we're gonna do this together. They took a uh, uh, that amount of time. So that's a lot of time, right? And typically you don't have five people working together six hours on one problem. So the problem here is, again, the one I said, which was data integration. And in fact, I think we already know if you, you can guys can download your or you can go look at your database textbooks. We already know how to solve data integration. That's been done. Uh, you can do ETL scripts or you can do cre query reformulation. Uh, so data integration is pretty much a solved problem uh, in practice. It takes a lot more complicated infrastructures to do these right. Um, but you can do it. You can build data integration systems, and this is one we did. This is the OpenFAX platform. If you go to dev.openfax.org, you can actually answer this question, and this you can answer this question just by clicking a couple buttons, and out the answers come. But you can do it for lots of other questions as well. Um, it's a bit more complicated, and I can talk to you about this if you're interested in how we did our particular data integration approach, and we used all the kind of fun semantic technologies that some of you know and love. But the point is, is we solved this, and it's great, and uh, actually we have a new Explorer up that looks even better than this. The, this one is kind of cool because we actually took out an existing um, uh, platform that was used inside a, inside a pharma company uh, we ripped out the back end of it and we put in our own back end. So this is the kind of boring interface that you typically get inside of a pharma company. And we get this great. You can, you can type in your queries. You get all these integrated data sets. And then uh, you, get, you give that to your user. And then they say, well, uh, oh, that's all great and stuff. But where did that come from? I don't trust this. 
like, why don't you trust it? Well, I don't, I don't know where the data comes from. How did you do this, right? Where did you get these uh, facts in this description? So this is the problem of transparency. We solved their problem of data integration. You don't have to take six, peop six uh, hours and five people, but then you integrate it and they say, well, where's it come from? Okay, that's our problem of transparency. Another example. So this is a, uh, an interesting example. So this is uh, a uh, example from the United States. Uh, this is called uh, globalchange.gov, and globalchange.gov is pretty interesting. It's an uh, interagency group within the United States government, so it's all these different uh, kind of organization with the United States government, and what they are charged to do by Congress is put together a report about the state of our knowledge, our meaning the United States knowledge, right? So about climate change. Every, it's like every 14 years or something like this. They're required to produce this report. Um, and they produce this report. It assembles all this information from all sorts of different authorities, whether it be NASA or NOAA, and they put together a report. And you can go to climate change glove, and they have this really nifty uh, report about climate change. You can cl click on different parts of uh, the map and find about, well, how is climate change affecting the southeast? What is the science to back that up? What do we know about cli climate change? And this is a policy report that's intended for, not for scientists, but for policymakers, right? So it's intended for people, well, you could think, uh, you know, politicians. And so an interesting problem that uh, politicians uh, will ask you, because they're politicians and climate change is a fairly controversial topic, at least in the United States, is uh, you've made this assessment, you've compiled this report, that's great. I couldn't read the underlying scientific data myself because I'm a policymaker, but I don't trust your assessment. What is this based on? How can I know what you're telling me is uh, true? So there's this fundamental tension, right, between this demand for integrated and summarized data, right, and the need for transparency and trust. And so those are two examples, one from d discovery and one from policy. So the question is, well, how do we go about solving, resolving this tension? Because we wouldn't want tension in our lives, right? We want to be relaxed. How do we make ourselves more relaxed? We do this by integrating and exposing data provenance um, provided by multiple sources. So uh, who's heard of provenance, the term provenance, a couple people? So it just means the history or where something comes from. Uh, just like uh, if you have uh, good chocolate, so we ate, ate some chocolate this afternoon from Switzerland and we know it was made in Switzerland, so we know chocolate from Switzerland, it's got to be good, right? Or if you're like me, who drinks very expensive coffee all the time, I want to know uh, where the coffee comes from, what, how it was brewed, who the farmer was. That gives me a sign of quality. And if you're a wine drinker, that's even more. You want to know the terroir from where the wine comes from. We want to do the same thing for our data. So one solution to this is uh, exposing the providence of our integrated data set. And we could do that by agreeing upon how we communicate and represent provenance data. And so I spent uh, a long time, about two years, on a W3C standards committee, and before that, working a lot of own research of provenance. Uh, how do you represent it? How do you capture it? And how do you reason about it? And we developed this uh, W3C provenance ontology. And this gives us a representation for how we can expose and integrate provenance. Phil, how long do I have, actually? Um, like another half an hour? Ah, oh, perfect. I'm, I'm, I go fast, so if I'm going too fast, uh, tell me. I'll slow down. So this model tells us how to interchange the provenance of data. 
right? So we can put it together, we can communicate it. Um, and if you want to know more, right, you can buy my book. It's cheap. I think you get it like $9 on Amazon.com. But anyway, so uh, PROV is a method and a uh, set of ontologies for describing the provenance of data. And once you describe the provenance of data, you can actually uh, tell people, okay, we integrate your data together and we'll tell you where it comes from. So let's look at it with open facts, our drug discovery uh, case. So what we did was we, um, we had this button that we added up here on top called uh, provenance, and you can click the button on, and uh, it will tell you, okay, we'll highlight in different colors the data sources. This kind of seems obvious, but highlight the different data sources where all this data comes from. What's interesting is each of these rows has different columns coming from different data sources because we did our data integration, right? So you can look back and you can say, oh, this comes from uh, the Concept Wiki, or this comes from the ChemSpider database, or this comes from the Kemble database. And I can actually click on it and go back to the original data source and find where we got that from. And this is really powerful, right? Because all these data sources are ones that our scientists already kind of know and love. They were the ones they were browsing to already. And so they feel a lot more confident in the data results. It's also quite good for us because we can then, in addition to knowing where that data comes from, we can describe how we integrated it. And that's what this kind of very blurry image over here is setting to do. What we can do is we describe the process by which we do that data integration. How do we do the actual record leakage, right? Uh, what algorithms are we using? Who are we depending on? Are we depending on curated sets of links? Right? Or did we do it algorithmically? And we can explain that all that. And sometimes what's interesting is we've had, in this project, we had uh, scientists come back. They said, hey, this data is wrong. Right? We don't trust your data. It's wrong. But we are able to trace it back to the original data provider. And in fact, the data is wrong in the original data, not because of some integration process, they said. And that helps both our users, but also uh, the data providers. We feed that back to the data providers. So that's a simple way of, of data provenance. So this, and this uses the standard for communicating it, right? So it means that all of our separate individual components, whether they're written in, oh, this part of it's in PHP, part of it's in Java, some of it's in, uh, I don't know, I think somebody did some stuff in Ruby, but because we have the standard, we can report it all out and integrate that provenance together. So the National Climate Change Assessment also uses PROV, so this global change report, the one that they are going to issue, so the one they did uh, in, uh, for this year has provenance in PROV described completely of how they produce this report. So the report itself links back to the data sets, which agencies were responsible for the data sets, which papers those data sets appeared in, who was responsible for those papers, also um, the software that was used in the actual data sets, all directly linked from the figures and the paragraphs that are available. And what's cool about this is that there's a complete API to do this. So you can actually write against this, go in, write queries about uh, who did what, give different kind of explorer views over the top of this provenance data, explain this complete trace of this policy report. So those are two examples of where having provenance lets us integrate data and provide transparency. So what's also nice about having a standard in some sense is the ability to have tooling, right? To write for different kinds of software. So I'm just gonna go really quickly through some of the tooling that's been developed for, for PROV uh, that lets you integrate different kinds of software stacks with uh, PROV and then interchange that information. So um, from Southampton, uh, they have this really nice stack called the Southampton Providence Suite. 
So they have libraries for dealing with provenance in Python, in JavaScript, and in Java, right? So you can work uh, with provenance that way. Uh, they have mechanisms for um, uh, extracting provenance statements from within uh, web pages. They have a validator as well. Um, this one I found just uh, yesterday when I was like doing these slides is provenance libraries for MATLAB, right? So if you're doing MATLAB uh, code, you can expose how you've done that in prov as well. So how your simulation code made it. Uh, this is one that's nice. It's uh, neuroimaging in Python, right? So it will, you can do your whole neuroimaging slicing in, and implement that in Python, and it will output uh, prov provenance, right, if you want it to. Uh, another one I just found is one for uh, seismology. So this is an extension to our ontology that lets, the, lets us describe different kinds of seismology experiments as well. So you can interchange that as well. Uh, this is in an upcoming, uh, so uh, are you familiar with HL7? HL7 is the standard for healthcare records in the United States, and they have an upcoming version called FHIR, which is supposed to be kind of an upgraded version of HL7. And within that, they're also having the provenance of healthcare records also represented with W3C prov. Uh, a lot of work uh, in the provenance community has come from scientific workflows. So uh, you see scientific workflow systems like Taverna support uh, provenance. This one's interesting. This is uh, Commando, and they're looking at, um, uh, what's it called? Um, messaging message bus infrastructure integrated with provenance as well. Um, this is an interesting example. This is di three different workflow systems, scientific workflow systems, so Apache OODT, uh, Pegasus, uh, Wings, and I think there's Lonnie, Lonnie Pipeline, so there's four different scientific workflow systems all integrated together all, you can trace back the entire processing pipeline, again, using prov. So there's a nifty uh, tutorial online. Uh, there's a LaTeX style for prov. It will automatically extract uh, prov from uh, your LaTeX source, so all the authors references those and represent it in prov. There's git to prov, so it will take your revision history of any GitHub repository and represent it in prov. There's one of my favorites, which is Stardog. It's a triple store that also supports querying over the provenance of your version database using prov. And then there's provoviz, so you give it some prov and it'll generate nifty D3 visualizations. So more and more tooling is coming for prov, and this is all great, this is fantastic. Happy we did this, but, right? So what's the problem? <coughs> the problem is it requires effort on the part of people to integrate provenance tracking into their systems, right? Into their scientific workflow systems, into your data integration systems, into your um, applications. They have to output provenance. And what we see is that data integration is manual. This is a downloads folder problem, right? I talked about the downloads folder problem. I don't know how many people have the downloads folder problem. I have it. I, I'm quite sick, right? Your downloads folder looks like this, and you've downloaded some data set. Where's my data set? PC.xlsx. That's probably a program committee. Uh, where is another data set in here? Um, somewhere in my downloads, uh, folder is a big Excel sheet, and I'm sure I've imported and copied and pasted it and munged it all together, right? And in order to capture that provenance, I would have to have some inf inf instrumentation, some modification of my code. So when we look at capturing provenance, uh, what we see is there's this spectrum of different kinds of systems that let us capture provenance. Uh, one I think I've been talking about the most is what I would call disclosed provenance, 
right? So you modify your application in order to output provenance information. And this is great because it's very accurate, right? You can capture high level semantics, right? These different operations. The problem is that it's intrusive and there's lots of manual effort in doing this. There's also other systems that actually instrument your operating system primarily, or some of the scientific workflow systems or message uh, bus systems, I'll call observe provenance. So you have very lightweight instrumentation in your uh, operating system. And these are great because they have a little bit less effort involved in capturing provenance, uh, so they're non-intrusive. But it's hard to capture those high-level semantics, right? And you get a lot of false positives, and I'll talk about that more in a second. So in some sense, you have this fidelity versus effort trade-off. So the more effort I put into capturing provenance, the better my provenance trace is, right? But um, it takes effort, right? And I'm fairly lazy, right? Notice my downloads folder problem. Um, but you might want... Uh, but if I have less fidelity, I can answer less problem. And the worst less fidelity is I have no provenance at all. Right? So we have this trade-off here. So how do we solve this problem? So this is kind of the next set of research that I, I've been working on with uh, some colleagues actually uh, at the VU, but who are from security. Right? So these guys do kind of like they, one of their claims to fame is they, they spotted the biggest um, uh, botnet attack and were able to thwart it kind of a couple years ago, right? So these are security guys. And we started looking at some of the techniques from the security community. Uh, one is called taint tracking, and the other is record and replay. And I'm going to talk about these two techniques um, and how we're using this to kind of try to solve this download pro folder problem. So let's look at one of the problems we talked about. One was this kind of lack of, uh, in this kind of um, observed provenance is the lack of fidelity. And so what does that mean? So the way uh, typical desktop provenance systems work is they have this black box, right? So your program that you run, and what they do is they track, oh, the inputs to the, the program you run, here are the outputs, and these should uh, link to each other, right? But we know that maybe does this file here actually depend upon this file? You don't know. The program that you run is a black box. Why? Because you didn't bother to instrument it, right? The only thing you know is what goes in and what comes out. So the question is, how do we solve this black box problem? So here what we use is a concept called taint tracking from uh, operating systems. And what you can do is use, um, essentially, modify how the bytes are moving through your low-level processor to actually mark which bytes uh, come from which other processes. Right? And so then there's some off-the-shelf uh, tools for doing this. Uh, so there's a tool called libdft, and what you do is you dynamically instrument your code at runtime uh, to actually instrument the system. And so I won't go into the details of that, but we have a whole papers about that, and we can talk about it some more. I'm here all week. Uh, but what's cool about this is by using um, uh, taint tracking, uh, we can solve what's called in provenance the n by m problem, which is the one I was showing you, right? That, in fact, your inputs may, all your outputs may not depend on all your inputs. Only some of your outputs may depend on some of your inputs, right? And in a typical provenance tracking, disclosed provenance, or uh, observed provenance tracking system, you would track everything. Okay. Does that make sense? So, um, do I have time for a video? How am I doing on time? Yeah. Uh, let's see. Uh, 
No. no it's, I need internet, though. Come on, ED room. Oh, no. Yay, there it goes. Back to their thing. There we go. Where's my mouse? All right. So we're just doing a demo here. OK, so here's VI. Um, where's my pause button? Ah. Uh. OK, so let's back up a little bit. All right, here we go. Did I lose the internet again? Ah, here we go. OK, so what we're going to do is we're going to actually run our taint tracking on VI, right? So what we've done is we have multiple four input files, and we're going to go ahead and run VI and load empty doc text. We're going to also track the data from standard in. So it takes a little bit of time to boot it up, but once you boot it up, you can just type. So we're going to read in a couple different uh, files. So world.txt, uh, cruel.txt, uh, hello.txt. So we've re read in three different files. We're going to actually edit the files in VI. And all the time, we're tracking provenance. right? Uh, and we're going to remove some contents, do some editing. Um, and the interesting thing here is we haven't modified VI at all, right? And we're going to write that to out.txt, and we're going to go and quit, quit VI. So we've just modified VI. So now what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at the raw provenance, uh, which is kind of just a fast kind of a way we output the provenance. And then we're going to convert this to prov. Right, our standard uh, way of doing it. So uh, we have a little script that takes this raw traced provenance and converts it to prof. And now what's cool uh, about it is that because it's in the standard, we can use other people's tools to go render it. So now we're gonna use prof toolbox, which is uh, something provided by Southampton to actually visualize uh, the provenance. So we just ge generated a um, PDF OK, so let's pause here. Uh, he's going to make it bitter, bigger, I think. OK, let's take a look at this. So what's interesting is now what we've done is without any uh, instrumentation of VI in a standard uh, Linux environment, we've tracked the provenance of our final output file, which is over here. Right, and zero is our standard input, uh, and we see that it's dependent on world.txt, and it's dependent on hello.txt. Um, let's see, uh, and we can see that vi is dependent on cruel.txt as well. Let's see, anything else in this? The interesting thing also is that we've grabbed a number of other files that you wouldn't normally expect as well, right? So these are files that are dependent, VI is dependent on, right? Not what you would normally uh, get. So that's the kind of interesting thing you can do um, with this kind of dynamic uh, taint tracking. Okay? So that's pretty, uh, pretty nifty. Uh, how do I uh, get rid of Safari?
All right, so that's great. We've solved the black box problem. You don't have to instrument your code. We can get really high resolution provenance. The problem is, is you may have not have noticed, but actually to boot up VI, it takes about 20 seconds. Okay, so it's slow, right? This dynamic tape tracking is slow. Once you've instrumented, once you've loaded up all the, the it's okay to run, but it's a bit slow. So how do we get around that? We want this high fidelity provenance that we can do with taint tracking. So what we're gonna do is we're, we've started looking at using record and replay technology. Anybody familiar with this at all? So in virtual machines, they have this capability to actually record what's going on in a virtual machine quite fast, right? So this is an example from Android rerun. This also was built into VMware for a while. There's different tools. One's called QEMU, which is another virtual machine, to do record and replay. So you can record the actual execution super fast, super well optimized, and then replay exactly what you've done, right, in a deterministic fashion. So we used record and replay for provenance, okay? So we capture the ac execution using this technology, and then we apply instrumentation when we replay it. So we don't apply this taint tracking, this complicated provenance instrumentation until we actually need it by just rerunning it. And what that means we can do is incremental provenance analysis, right? So we can add more and more instrumentation to uh, the system as we might like more details, right? And we use a technique, uh, this, there's a thing called Panda that lets you do this kind of instrumentation of virtual machines. So that's the thing, with a record and replay, all you get is this instruction ran, this instruction ran, this instruction ran. It's very, very low level. That's why you can capture it fast, but there's no dependency information. It's kind of useless for, uh, just a record of your VM is useless for provenance. You can't write any sort of, like this file depended on this file, depended on this file. And so that's why we wanna instrument it with provenance, but we wanna do it after the fact, right? We don't wanna do it as we're actually executing the system. So that's the trick, right? So let's do a little an example. So here's an example. We, um, <coughs> here what we do is we run, um, we already have a, uh, a capture of a trace, right? Alice.et is a capture of a, of a VM trace that we've done. And what we do is we actually rerun that with a set of Panda plugins. One is called Prov Tracer, which is what we built. And that will generate some high level provenance uh, detail. Then what we can do is we can write a Sparkle query over that provenance. So this is kind of abstract level provenance. It's only giving you, uh, for example, the file descriptors, some of the process names, the dependencies between the files and the provenance. So then we can write a provenance query. And here what we did was we say, well, find me all the files, the text files, that were generated by some uh, editor, like VI, right, okay? And get me the started and end times of that. So we get those start and end times. And then what we could do is we can actually clip down the VM trace. And so that's in the next slide. So we replay. Uh, our VM trace again, this time only using uh, that frame that we had, so a smaller VM trace. Now we have a clipped down version of the trace we're interested in, and we're gonna run actually a much more complicated analysis. In this particular analysis, what it does is search for particular strings in the memory locations of every process. So a super expensive thing to do. Right, so in every memory lo location that gets allocated, we're gonna search for the string llamas are late. And then we're gonna output that. So what we've done is clip down our trace to the ones that have to do with editors, right? That time period, we're gonna output that. We replay it 
with this more intensive provenance analysis. Right? And then we can rerun our a new query and say, well, find me um, <coughs> all the via executions in this case, uh, or find me all the places that have this particular piece of text in it, and we get the VI runs that actually modified or had this llamas are lame piece of text. Okay, so we've been able to kind of uh, progressively add richer and richer provenance analysis while having a very lightweight mechanism for capturing that provenance. So this is kind of the, the thing we've been working on uh, lately. So to kind of wrap up, um, there's really a tension between putting stuff together, data integration, and then documenting what's been done. We all kind of know this through our uh, download folder problem, right? We download stuff, and we don't really want to take the time to document how we actually pulled everything around. That's why writing papers is so kind of a pain. Uh, provenance helps, but we have to capture provenance. So there's issues in actually collecting provenance. It takes work. There's a lot of effort. So I've talked to you about two uh, kinds of solutions for this. One is to use standards, so by providing standard tooling uh, and being able to integrate provenance from different programs, we can help. And the other is what I call stealth, and I stole that from Carol Goebel, and that is to try to put as much of this under the hood and make it as simple and easy to capture provenance so that later we can add instrumentation that we need. Um, and so there's a lot of background work on that. So thanks, and I guess we all want to go have a beer or something. Thanks,